Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 4, again reading from the Message Bible. But a man named Ananias, his wife Sapphira, conniving in this with him, sold a piece of land, secretly keeping part of the price for himself, and then brought the rest to the apostles and made an offering of it. Peter said, Ananias, how did Satan get you to lie to the Holy Ghost and secretly keep back part of the price of the field? Before you sold it, it was all yours. And after you sold it, the money was yours to do with as you wished. So what got into you to pull a trick like this? You didn't lie to men, but to God. I want to talk this morning about when the church goes horribly wrong. When church goes horribly wrong. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. I want to begin by saying there is nothing wrong with the church, but there is obviously something wrong with some of us in the church. Uh, the church in and of itself is a problem-free organism. The church made up of its members is often a problem-filled organization. So there's nothing wrong with the church, but there is obviously something wrong with some of us in the church. Uh, the poet had it correctly when they declared that to live above with the saints in love would be glory. But to live below with some of the saints I know, that's a different story. That's what you find really in the book of Acts in chapter 5. And what I want to do is unpack Acts chapter 5 that day when the church went horribly wrong. I want to do so in three different ways. The first way that I want to unpack Acts chapter 5 is to remind some and to inform others that before the church went wrong, it was right. Before the church went wrong, it was right. Sometimes you need to tell people on your job because they talk so much. They ain't been there for 30 days. But they talk so much about how bad the job is, how that uh, all of the people are hypocrites and nobody can be trusted. Sometimes you need to pull them to the side and say, baby, it wasn't like that before you got in. <laughs> that, that is, it may have some problems now, but we were doing pretty good before you showed up. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through verse 37, you discover the conditions in the church prior to this calamity that occurs in Acts chapter 5. Look at verse 32 through verse 37 of Acts chapter 4. There the Bible says, The whole congregation of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine, you can't have it. They shared everything. The apostles gave powerful witness to the resurrection of the master Jesus, and grace was on all of them. And so it turned out that not any person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering for it. If you remember back in Acts chapter 2, people had come to Jerusalem from all over the known world. Their goal was to come to Jerusalem, celebrate the annual feast of Passover, and then they were to go back home. They did it every year. They would come down for Passover, observe that 
celebration. Then some 50 days later, they would observe the celebration of Pentecost, and then they would go back home. Something happened that particular year. Jesus was crucified around Passover, resurrected shortly thereafter, but then the power of God fell on the day of Pentecost. The power fell so strongly. God's glory was so thick around them until nobody wanted to go back home. Well, if you think about that, you've got thousands of people who are now living in a territory that is not their own. How do you provide for them? Well, those in the church decided that they would take things that they did not need. They would sell those things and then the proceeds from the sale would be used to help those displaced families. Now, often if they had extra houses or extra pieces of land, they would sell that house or sell that land, bring all of the money, lay it down at the apostles' feet and say to them, spend this however you deem it necessary. And that's what you find in verse 34 and in verse uh, 35. They brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. The apostles then distributed it according to each person's need. And now they're going to talk about one person in particular. Joseph, called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of comfort, a Levite born in Cyprus, sold a field that he owned, brought the money, and made an offering of it to the apostles. What I'm getting at is, before the church went wrong in chapter 5, it was going right in chapter 4. Can I ask you something? Is it a part of your life that used to be going better than it is right now and the reason it's been going worse is because of somebody you let in the door? <laughs> Things were so peaceful before they showed up. And now that they are on board, you've changed your song from red sails in the sunset to stormy weather. <laughs> I had to get some old school in there somewhere. Before the church went wrong, it was right. That's what you find in Acts chapter 4 verse 32 through verse 37. They were behaving like brothers and sisters, taking care of one another as best they could. So if I were unpacking Acts chapter 5, that would have to be the first unpacking. To prove that before the church went wrong, it was right. Well, let me see if I can unpack this chapter a step further by sharing with you this. When the church went wrong, it went horribly wrong. Which means they didn't just have a little snafu. When they messed up, they messed up horribly. Now, you'll find all of this in Acts chapter 5, but let me recap briefly what brings us to Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 1, the church is promised. In Acts chapter 2, the church is produced. In Acts chapter 3, the church is promoted. In Acts chapter 4, the church is persecuted. But then, in Acts chapter 5, the church is purged. You know what it means to purge something? It means to clean out what doesn't need to be there. Somebody's going to get mad. Somebody's going to get glad. Purging is when God cleans something out that doesn't need to be there. And could it be the reason your life is not operating the way that it should is because you have something in it that needs to be purged. You know what would be beautiful, Brother Knox, 
is if we were the problem in an equation and we simply learn how to purge ourselves. Because Doug, I do that sometimes. If I walk into a room and it appears that I have changed, shifted the whole atmosphere of the room, everybody was happy before I got in there, now they mad. I, I don't spend my time trying to change all of their attitudes. I just say, you know what? Maybe this ain't the room for me. And I go find me another room. I go back to the room I came out of. How much better off would life be if we purged out that which was destroying us, and if we found ourselves being destructive, we removed ourselves. Sadly, as I watch local, state, federal, and global news, I'm always running into people that I wish would have taken themselves out of the equation. I was watching a television program not long ago. Uh, it was concerning people who were receiving plastic surgery, not merely because there was something about themselves that they did not like. It was because they had gone through some form of trauma. There was a scar left behind by the trauma, and they wanted the scar removed. The first young woman that they uh, did this examination on and interviewed her life had been shot some eight to nine times by her husband. I say, now that's a shame. All over, and she survived. But all over her body were bullet wounds from where she had been shot by her husband. I kept listening to the story only to discover that after her husband shot her, he also shot their children and killed himself. She had been in a coma for days before they even informed her of what had happened to her children and to her husband. Let me just say something to you for free and to your cousin. If you got somebody in your life and, 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 and you can't be with them and you don't want them with anybody else, leave. Get on a plane, get on a bus, get on a bicycle, leave. Go somewhere. Leave the rest of us alone. You don't like you, take you going on with you. But quit bothering people who are not trying to bother you. Sometimes you have to remove negative from a situation and other times when you are the negative, you need to remove yourself. I say to, young, to every young man, I say to every young woman, there is nothing cute, there is nothing cute, there is nothing cute about a man or woman putting their hands on you. Well, she just loved me. She don't want me talking to anybody else. And that's how you got them scratches on your arm? Because at 16, they may be scratches, they may be knife wounds at 26. See, he just loved me. He don't want nobody else around me. No, he's possessive. He's insecure. And he may be trying to cover up what he's doing when you are not around. Come on, Pastor. Well, she just need to do what I say. You need to do what he says. Amen. And get your mind on something else. Around here trying to control people. What do you have for them? The old folks would say, try, you around here trying to tell somebody what to do. You 16, they 15, you trying to tell them what to do. What do you have to offer? Still got Spider-Man sheets on your bed. What do you have to offer? Old folks would say it like this, you don't have a pot. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're going, 
Don't Google that thing when you get home. We got to get out of this thing of where current generations are still struggling with the curses of previous generations. And brother or sister, as adults, if you've already seen it in your own life, you ought to be able to spot the signs in your children's life. All of a sudden, they don't talk to any of their friends they used to talk to. They used to be real close, and now all of a sudden, they don't talk to them at all. You need to sit down with them and ask them, why did you cut this friend up? But Ray say he don't want me around now. Ray say they're always in our business, and I need to put some di distance between us and them. No, what Ray is doing is trying to isolate you from everybody who loves you. So that when he shows you his true self, you'll feel ashamed to call on the people you used to call on. Better learn how to talk to Jesus and leave Ray alone. Because you ain't that desperate for nothing. Pastor, I need love. I need somebody to hold my hand. Maybe that's why God gave you two of them. So you can take this hand and hold this hand. That's, I need somebody to hug me every now and then. Take both of these arms he gave you. Wrap them around yourself. Spray you on some new perfume. And say, ooh, I smell so good. When the church went wrong, it went horribly wrong. And what did God do? He purged them. Well, Pastor Thorpe, what went wrong? What really went wrong in Acts chapter 5? I'm so glad you asked. It's in verse 1 through verse 5. Now remember, at the end of Acts chapter 4, we read about a man named Joseph. His common name was Barnabas. Barnabas took some land, sold the land, brought all the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. The apostles took the money, gave it to the people who needed it. Now, look at verse 1 of chapter 5. But a man, you need to always watch any passage that starts off with but a man. But a man named Ananias, his wife Sapphira, conniving in this with him, sold a piece of land, secretly kept part of the price for himself, and then brought the rest of the apostles and made an offering of it. The problem was not his offering. The problem was not the size of his offering. The problem was he lied about the offering. Look at Peter's response. Peter said, Ananias, how did Satan get you to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back part of the price of the field? Before you sold it, it was all yours. And after you sold it, the money was yours to do with as you wished. So what got into you to pull a trick like this? You didn't lie to men, but to God. Now watch verse 5. This is God purging. Now some of y'all ain't going to like verse 5. And some of y'all are never going to experience purging because you're not willing to do what it takes to allow purging to occur. Ananias, when he heard these words, fell down dead. That put fear of God into everyone who heard it. I bet it did. I bet it did. Everybody got word and said, you know what happened in church today? Ananias came in with a boatload of money, handed the money to the apostles. They said, where did the money came from? He said, I had a piece of property. I sold the property for $85,000. And here is all of the money. When the truth was, he sold the property for a hundred grand and kept 15 for himself. Why lie? 
And God was so concerned about protecting the purity of the church until he purged the church. What was it that got into old Ananias and his wife Sapphira to cause them to mess up so terribly? I'll tell you what it was. Pride got in the way. Pride got in the way. What most scholars believe, Mr. Lawson, is that Ananias and Sapphira were in, were in church the day that Barnabas showed up and Barnabas took his offering, gave it, and the whole church erupted in applause. And Ananias and Sapphira pulled each other to the side and they said, we need the church to clap for us like that too. So what we need to do is, we need to see what land we have, sell some land, bring the money given in church, and we can be applauded. But their hearts were in the wrong place. And even, they, even though they could have afforded to give it all, they kept the part back for themselves and lied about what they did bring. C.L. Franklin, the late father of the late Aretha Franklin, said that he always believed that when you're in church and you're giving an offering, you ought to have people to stand up and come around and give the offering. He says you should never let folks stay at their seat and just pass the plate. He said he was in church one Sunday and saw a fella in the back of the church and the fellow wanted to give $100. He took a $100 bill out of his pocket. He wanted to give it in church. But the basket started from the front and was making its way to the back. Well, the longer he held on to that $100, he said, you know what? Maybe the Lord want me to give $75. So he puts up the $100 bill, takes out $75. The longer that plate took to get to him, he said, maybe the Lord don't want me to give 75. Maybe he wants me to give 50. So he put up uh, 25 of them, just held uh, the other 50. The plate was still taking too long to get there. By the time the plate got to him, he stole $5 out of him. Pride gets in the way. Hey, they, they wanted maximum exposure. Ananias and Sapphira did. Uh, look at verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6, the younger men went right to work. This is after Ananias died. The younger men went right to work, wrapped him up, then carried him out and buried him. Watch verse 7. Not more than three hours later, his wife, knowing nothing of what had happened, came in. Peter said, now this bothered me. This thing bothered me, brother Jeff. This bothered me. Because she's three hours separated from her husband. She doesn't, now she knew he was going to lie. She didn't know he was going to die after he lied. And this bothered me because I wanted to know, Brother Rick, on your birthday weekend. I wanted to know if Peter already knew that her husband was a dead liar, why wouldn't he spare her from the same fate? I, I always wondered why Peter didn't say to her, uh, hold on, ma'am. Before you come in here, let me tell you some stuff that done went down. Your husband thought he was lying to men. He was actually lying to the Holy Spirit. He lied about a land purchase, and now he's dead. You got anything you want to say? No. Text says, Peter said, tell me, were you given this price for your field? Yes, she said, that price. Peter responded, what's going on in here that you connived to conspire against the spirit of the master? 
The men who buried your husband are at the door and you are next. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than she also fell down dead. When the young men returned, they found her dead body. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. By this time, the whole church, and in fact, everyone who heard of these things, had a healthy respect for God. They knew God was not to be trifled with. Why did God kill both of them? Because both of them were dirty. Why does your life not get straight? Because you keep the part you like and cut off the part you don't like. I told you what I don't like this. God is saying, if you really want me to fix it, I got to fix all of it. If you really want me to cut it out, you got to let me cut all of it out. Because the Lord is trying to get some people and some problems out of your life, and you keep bringing pieces of them back in. Lord woke you up in the middle of the night and showed you every dog you've been running with. And you say, Lord, I'm going to put the dog out, but can I still call the dog? Can I still walk the dog? Can I still feed the dog? Lord, you do know if I don't feed the dog, the dog won't eat. Die. You're not the dog's mama. And if you weren't taking care of them, oh, they'd find somebody. I wish I had somebody knew what I was talking about. The Lord says, I am going to purge them because pride had gotten in the way. Hey, let me give you another one. Not only had pride gotten in the way, but prayerlessness had gotten in the way. In verse 3 and in verse 9, you find that Ananias and Sapphira listened to the devil instead of listening to to God. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, we are told that if we submit ourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Which means if you pray, God will show you where the devil is, even if the devil is in you. Because all the people in your life you think you got a problem with, is some of you in there too. Well, y'all deep on whatever Sunday is in. I have to catch myself often, 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 often. Not to walk in the flesh, but to force myself to walk in the spirit. Because I don't done shot some folks. If I just walk in the if I just walk in the flesh, you got to learn how to walk in the spirit. So, Bernicia, several months ago, several months ago, someone went online and said something very ugly about me and about our church. They went online, wrote it. They took the time to write it. Said something very ugly about us as a church and by me as a pastor. Wrote it. Put it on there for everybody to see. So when I saw it, I was traveling and I saw it on my phone and when I got to Jacksonville that day, I couldn't wait to find it on my phone because I was going to contact her and her pastor. I was just as sure as I'm standing here drinking this water. I tried so hard to find that thing, I was burning my own fingers up, trying to find them on my phone. I said, I'm going to tell her about what herself. And then I'm going to call her pastor and tell him what I told her, because I ain't need neither one of them looking at me funny. Lord wouldn't let me find her. Couldn't find the comment anywhere. And I searched all over. <laughs> Couldn't find the comment anywhere. Search high and low. 
Still couldn't find a comment. Anyway. Several months later, she reached out to me. She said, Pastor Thorpe, I hear you're running for office. She said, I want to remind you of something I watched you do. She said, I watched you speak at a press conference when the police union was calling for the termination of the chief of police after a police officer released a dog on a nine-year-old boy. And Pastor, you spoke with such clarity, such authority on that day. She said, and I want to tell people to vote for you because you know how to handle yourself. And I thought to myself, if I had stayed in my flesh three months earlier, I would have missed out on this opportunity three months later. What could you be missing out on when your pride and your prayerlessness get the best of you? Because truth be told, sometimes it feels good to your flesh to get things off your chest. Oh, I got them straight. I told them. But you don't know what God is trying to do down the road. Amen. I'm not saying let people walk all over you. I ain't telling you that. <laughs> but I am saying you got to know how to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. Before the church went wrong, it was right. When the church went wrong, it went horribly wrong. Here's the last thing and I'm done. God can take what's wrong and make it right. You see him beginning to do it in verse 5. Bible says, Ananias, or says of Ananias, when he had heard those words, fell down, fell down dead. The consequence was that put the fear of God into everyone who heard it. That means God was hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick. Uh, a crooked stick. In verse 10 through verse uh, 11, the same thing occurred with his wife, Sapphira. She died, and the Bible says great fear spread throughout the church. But watch what you find in verse 12 through verse 16, and I'm done. Through the work of the apostles, many God signs were set up among the people. Many wonderful things done. They all met regularly and in remarkable harmony on the temple porch named after Solomon. But even though people admired them a lot, outsiders were weary about joining them. On the other hand, those who put their trust in the master were added right and left, men and women both. They even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on stretchers and bedrolls, hoping they would be touched by Peter's shadow when he walked by. They came from the villages surrounding Jerusalem, throngs of them bringing the sick and the devil. And they all were healed. You know what that means? When God got the foolishness out, he could keep on blessing. And when God gets the foolishness out of any church, he can continue to bless. But when God gets the foolishness out of your life, he can continue to bless. And always remember, the foolishness is not necessarily some other person that you can point to. Sometimes the foolishness is in you. How much foolishness you got in you? Go on, go on, tell me. Go on, tell me. No, no, no. Don't do it tonight. You'll be in church until Tuesday. But be honest about the fact you got some foolishness in you. Somebody in this room, you got a slick tongue. Cuts like a knife. Slick tongue. You know who you use it on the most? The people you claim to love the most. Slick tongue. Somebody in this room, you have a dismissive attitude. That means you feel entitled. 
the more people do for you, the more you act like you deserve it. You got to the place now, you sit down to eat a meal, you don't even pause to tell God thank you, let alone thank the person who brought it to you. And you got a list of people you can't stand. And the Lord is saying, I got a list of things in you that I can't stand. But if you let me work on it, I can change it. I can fix you. 